Okay, we are live. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party in Australia. And I have a specific reason for inviting you today, Robbie. Thank you for uh, agreeing to this. Last night, I got a call from a friend of mine said, what do you think Robbie Barwick thinks about the G20? My first thought was, do you know Robbie Barwick? This is a Chinese friend of mine. Do you know Robbie? Yeah, everybody knows Robbie Barwick. So your fame has reached China and that people know that we know each other and they're asking my opinion of your opinion. So I thought the best way to find out is to invite you onto the show. So the second time and only you're, you're my first and my third guest. So you're very, very uh, welcome back to my show. Thanks once again for, for agreeing. So no, we're, happy to we're going to talk today just about the G20. So are you ready for that? Yep. Okay, cool. I basically have three questions that I want to put to you today, and they're all very simple. The first question is, what did you take away from the President Xi, President Biden meeting? Well, generally, good. Um, meeting is better than not meeting. Talking True. is better than not talking. And yeah. uh, these two gentlemen, you know, the, um, the the two most powerful men in the world uh, know each other quite well, right? They, they have a relationship that goes back more than a decade to when both were vice presidents mm -hmm. at the same time as well. So um, uh, it's good when, you know, they can talk to each other and size each other up. Uh, now, um, like with everything that's happened vis-a-vis -vis China and the West in recent times, you have to see what comes out of it. And my scepticism is about the genuineness, not on the Chinese side, but on the um, American side, because you've got you've got real fanatics in the Biden administration like Anthony Blinken that are desperately anti-China. Um, and he apparently is going to be visiting China as a follow-up to this um, meeting. Now, you know, Biden, um, if you put aside the speculation about, you know, Biden losing his capacities with his age, et cetera, Biden has a certain fairly affable style, right? Yep. And he, he's clearly a personable guy, personable guy. And I'm sure in person you can see the photos of them laughing together, big smiles, et cetera. Um, I'm sure in person Biden, Biden can turn on the charm in a meeting and and perhaps even mostly sincerely. But um, uh, if we didn't if we didn't know it before, I, cert I certainly learned it with the Trump administration that that a president is not a president on his own. There's a team around him. Right. And mm. that those people, depending on who they are, can can have an enormous influence. And so I, I just know our appraisal of Anthony Blinken as secretary of state, the fact that he, he's, he, he's a, he looks like a very professional, smooth kind of guy. Mm. But he's the, his, his predecessor was one of the, like just a total thug, a thug walking the world stage named Mike Pompeo. Nothing diplomatic about him, an absolute yeah. ideological thug. And yet, and the things that Pompeo did right at the end to put, to put time bombs in the relationship with China, such as mm -hmm. taking the um, East Turkestan Islamic movement off the... Um, uh, terrorist list, terrorist list uh, mm. declaring Xinjiang genocide. Yeah, this this person who superficially is a very different kind of person, much more professional person than Pompeo, less religiously fanatical, perhaps. He just kept that going. Yeah, right? he hasn't undone it. Yeah. No, exactly. Do you think? I, you, I didn't know this. You just mentioned that Blinken is coming to China. I, I haven't heard that. Um, no, I'm, I, I'm out of touch there. That's my understanding. The follow up yeah. will be will be Blinken. Um, uh, visiting China uh, for some ongoing negotiations, and the person who um, passed that information on to me expressed a lot of uh, pessimism, <laughs> given that it was that it was Anthony Blinken. Um, I, I actually see it differently. I, I don't see that pessimistically. If it depends on what he does. Now, of course, in, in a state visit like that, a State Department visit, not a state visit, but a State Department visit. When he comes over, it's extremely stage managed. He gets to see only what they want him to see. That's that's a problem. But 
you know, when he flies in and he catches that train, uh, if he gets a high speed train from one city to another and he sits in that uh, the, the business class. I don't know if you've seen the business class on the high speed train. It's like first class on on Qantas. It's really, really comfortable. Right. Uh, you know, if, if, if they get him into that kind of environment and take him down and show him Shenzhen and show him Shanghai, he, you know, it's got to it's got to open his eyes to something because. I don't know if you agree with this. The way I view most Americans that I talk to online are anti-China. Not all of them, there's, but they're, they're led to believe China is a bad place. And they believe that all the Chinese people are walking around with some kind of yoke of oppression. That's my way of describing it. And they need rescuing from this evil government. Now, if Blinken comes across and he sees, and he will see real people in real situations even though he won't probably interact with them he'll go to the great wall but he won't see the real people at the great wall because he will be closeted inside of a, a safety a safety net or secure area uh, he'll go to xian perhaps and go and see the terracotta warriors but it'll be closed the day he goes there it'll just be the entourage that goes while he's there yeah. that yeah. kind of thing so he won't get to see the real china but he'll he'll be in a motorcade going through the streets of beijing or Shanghai, or wherever he, the, the meeting takes place. I think it might be it might be enough for him to say, "Well, it's not exactly what I thought it was," because he does think. I believe he thinks that along but those that, lines. But but wouldn't he have visited China? I would imagine someone like him would have visited China quite a few times. No idea before mm, COVID. No idea. They, I'll tell you one of the, like that. A sincere person would have that response, and that's why that's why this China should have a program of getting every American to come and visit for a few weeks and actually experiencing that to take and and yeah. and throw in throw in Australia while you're at it, right? We could, we should do it as well. Um, that would be great. the The difference is, I do know there's a there's a there's a more of an ide ideological current that um, unfortunately Anthony Blinken's a part of, and it's his mm -hmm. relationship with George Soros. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of conspiracy theorizing online about George Soros. He's to blame for everything. Well, that's not quite true. He's not to blame for absolutely everything, but he's a very um, ideologically twisted person when it comes to China, hates mm -hmm. China with a passion. And um, he has this view of, you know, he calls it the Open Society Foundation. That's that's what he pushes. And he actually advocates regime change around the world. And the Soros archives, the Open Society Foundation archives in the United in the Europe, are named after Anthony Blinken's father. Um, so there's a there's a there's more of a, a a particular ideological connection there that I'm not comfortable with with him. Hmm. But that said, but that said, there's another factor here, which is that um, full court press by the West that that that, that, that they want to. They want to um, engineer another Sino-Russia split, right? Because of <laughs> because of what's happening in Ukraine, and so when there's an ulterior motive, then there's a certain charm offensive. And suddenly, this is what struck me, and we'll talk about it more in a minute from the standpoint of Australia meeting our Prime Minister meeting Xi. Suddenly, you've got. I mean, <laughs> I mean, picture this. America has called. What China is doing in Xinjiang genocide, that's its official position. Yet the president of the United States was shaking hands and laughing with the equivalent of Adolf Hitler. And it doesn't matter. Well, the, the right? genocide claim has been rejected by the Justice Department. It's only the State Department that says this, not the Justice Department. So technically, the American legal opinion is that it's not genocide. But the State Department before uh, Pompeo left was that it is genocide. So even well, that um, is, a, is a, it's a specific ambiguity that I think maybe the Americans are quite happy with. You know, they don't say it is, but they, they don't say it is. They love ambiguity, uh, Jerry. It's their strategic special. ambiguity, they call that. Yeah. Biden, what did you think um, about uh, Biden's statement where he, he actually made the statement he believes that uh, China has no intention of invading Taiwan. If I can use the word invade Taiwan for a province of your own country. But he, he actually used those words. What did you make of that? Do you think that was a stand down to his military? Well, I think it more, I'm not qualified to, to I could only guess at that sort of thing. I'm, I'm, well, that's I'm all we're doing and we don't I'm, know their, their thought processes. Well, I, I like, I mean, I'm, 
I just know I, I my view of it is um it's a statement of what they knew all along but oh yeah but, I agree but with that they, yeah. there's a um there's a host there's a hostile climate in the United States politically a uh, that that they feel as as democratic politicians they have to fit in with whatever the climate of the of the day is mm. and so um that served a certain purpose but they can clearly tell from from their what what real interactions they have with China that China has no intention to invade um uh Taiwan unless under American influence, Taiwan goes and does something really silly, like mm. their independence, and they're 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 not probably not inclined to do that. And China China wants to reunify clearly, and they're very 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 patient. But the Americans, there's a huge debate waging in the raging in the United States about what they're capable of doing on the world stage, and what the smarter ones are capable of doing. And I do think I don't think Biden is stupid. What the smarter ones know is they can't fight a war on two fronts. Right, and so yeah. this would be crazy for them um, to to uh, continue provoking something in Taiwan. They so now they don't have enough difficult. weapons. <laughs> They're running yeah. out of weapons. Well, of course. And the other thing is, the other thing is, they know. I, I think the Chinese are, in their own way, it's a, it's a paradox. You know, we have this old racist trope, the inscrutable Oriental. But I think in, the, in their own way, the Chinese are almost the most transparent people going around because they have a very black and white um, uh, approach to relations. Yeah. We will you 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 sh you act in good faith to us. We will act in good faith to you. We will reciprocate, right? Yeah. Um, and so Biden would have known that of all the things he could have said to um, promote goodwill in that discussion, that's probably the most significant thing he could have said. Right, and the I fact think, that, I think that one and the genocide. If if Biden had just stood up and said, you know, we don't think there's anything really sinister going on in Xinjiang, and and honestly, they know there's nothing sinister going on in Xinjiang, but they're perpetuating that myth. So those two things are really. I mean, the Hong Kong thing's nothing to do with America, and the UK are really a little bit more into, involved in that. Uh, yeah. Although it's nothing to do with America, they still interfere in it. But I I, I personally think that uh, if 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 we really wanted to see something happening, then that thing needs to be written off. It needs to be clearly understood that you know, we really know that you know, we were misled into believing. That's their, that's their face saving. Uh, they were misled and they have been misled by the likes of. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing is they paid for people to mislead them. And, and yeah. so now they can now they've got their, their, their useful fool or useful tool. Uh, whatever the definition you prefer, but they've got their useful tool who they paid money to do the research. Now they can dishonor or di uh, dis dispute what that person said. And, and that, I mean, basically, Adrian Zenz and ASPI and those people who are doing this and getting paid to do this are probably going to have their reputations shattered when the truth comes out. And they the truth find, is out. Just they not should believe find it. a way. They should find a way to pin all the blame on Drew Pavlou. And move on. <laughs> oh, come on, Drew. Um, much as I dislike everything he stands for, he's not responsible for anything. He's just, he's just a coattail dragger. He's he's hauling on to a place where he can grab some income. Drew, Drew's not responsible for anything. I mean, he, he doesn't That's even true. drum up hate. He just he just scores from it. He's. I, th I think you're probably giving Drew a lot more credit than he deserves in that respect. He, he's uh, Drew, Drew's a smart young man. I mean, there's no doubt about that. He's a smart young man. He, he's doing very well out of this, and, and all he's done is jumped on a bandwagon and, and, and ridden it. And he's enjoying the ride. Good for him. You know, he gets uh, side trips to Switzerland and stuff like that. And, and his mates are paying for it. So good for him, good for them. They're just wasting their own cause effectively. And making themselves look foolish in the eyes of anybody who really understands the situation. Yeah, um, for sure. Let, let's move on from the Biden thing because I, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, before we move on from the Biden thing, my view is that he is quite genuine. He would like this to happen, but he doesn't control the Congress, he doesn't control the Senate, he doesn't control the media, and he doesn't control public opinion. And to be seen to be soft on China means that uh, he, he's going to go back and he's going to face hostility. So 
I think the, the, the good words can't transcend into good deeds. That's my opinion on that one. Um, and I don't know if you agree with that, but I, personally, I think that Biden that's the is that's the Biden danger. acting in reasonably good faith. Uh, and he, it's not that he doesn't want this to be better, the relationship, but he, he, you said the word, he's not the powerful, the most powerful person in the world that we thought he was. You know, you know, he can't do the things he wants to do because the courts will overturn him. The Senate and the Congress will overturn him and public opinion will overturn him. Otherwise, he won't get reelected. And I just remembered one other thing that I was briefed yep. about from the discussion. He had a very flippant um, comment about the um, the sanctions on China to stop them from using the Taiwanese microchips, the, mm -hmm. the, the boycott on China over that. And and he referred to he made some historical reference to um, uh, when when the Chinese were cut off from some kind of um, high technology weaponry by the Soviet Union back in the day. And and the Chinese were able to uh, uh, innovate. And and um, a few years later, they invent, they they uh, built their own hydrogen bomb. Right? Mm -hmm. and so they showed that they could get around it. And so Biden was probably hoping it would be taken as a, a backhanded compliment. Yeah. Nevertheless, it was actually, it's one of the more dangerous and, and um, uh, targeted things the americans have done against china this 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 action on the microchips it probably that will is. happen that way. it probably will happen that way but yeah. it, but it's an act of real hostility by the americans well, there's, there's no doubt in my opinion uh, no doubt at all that it's going to hurt it's hurting china there's yeah. no doubt about that but it's also hurting chip manufacturers because yeah. they can't deal with china so I mean, they, I mean, they can deal with China, but it's only a certain quality level of chip, that, and, and I'm not really into it. But the fact is, there's no doubt at all that China's artificial intelligence technology, it's it's going to hurt that that industry. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's inevitable. So my conclusion yeah. is, I'm hoping I'm hoping there was genuineness there, and and if there is, the Chinese will reciprocate. But we have to see. Yeah, watch what China says. Watch what China does, and you usually find they marry up. Watch what America says and what America does, and they don't. They're, they're magnets. They're just not attracting each other. Uh, so that, that's my view on that. Second second question I wanted to ask you. Pierre Le Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau. I'm, I'm showing my age here. Yeah, <laughs> the, the son of the father. He got a right bollocking from Xi Jinping, and it was on global television. And he walked away like a recalcitrant child. What do you make of that? Well, I had to look up um, some context. And right. my understanding is that there was some earlier form of discussion, which then people in the Canadian government, whether it's, uh, I'm assuming Trudeau's entourage, leaked it to the Canadian press yeah. And leaked it in the context of sounding tough on the domestic political issue of hysteria about foreign interference. Now, when I saw that, I then had a I, I then formed a quite a definite view of what's going on because um we know a lot about the foreign interference claims that were attributed um the allegations about China foreign foreign interference in Australia. Mm. We, we investigated it exhaustively and we concluded it was a crock. It was absolute garbage, and, it, and it, but it was invented by the Five Eyes Intelligence Network. This was a very big right. part of the shift that they were, engin they were able to engineer in Australia politically. And Canada is also part of the Five Eyes. So if their foreign interference hysteria is anything like ours, I regard it as absolutely bogus, right? But what it does do, it creates a, a climate of hysteria that then starts to define everything. And so it sounds like now Canada is a big exporter to uh, China, like we are, right? I mean, you, you know, China is the big consumer of raw materials. Um, yep. So the Canadian, you know, Tr Trudeau would have certain pressures on one side saying, you know, we've got to have some kind of stability in the relationship here. But on the other side, he's got people saying, you've got to stand up for China. And the big issue is foreign interference. And so they chose. Whatever, clearly she was very upset because they had a some form of a, a, a discussion slash agreement that then was leaked to the 
Canadian media in a way that seemed to misrepresent what the meeting was about, mm-hmm. right? And because that served Trudeau's domestic political purposes. And I think um, this is this is something that enrages me about how world politics is played, global, pol- global politics is played. That's what I was saying before about China's pretty transparent. They want to, you know, have have um, uh, conversations they can trust, right, yep. et cetera. And so the fact that she took the opportunity to express that, I personally think is justified, and it's and it's extraordinary. But I people tell me, you know, I've I've been I've, I've rejected this wolf warrior stuff, like the the way that everything China has done the last few years is characterised as wolf warrior, because yep. It's like it's it's why I made the reference to Hitler before. If you're accused of being the worst people in the world by these same assholes who who want to make a lot of money out of you, at a certain yeah. point you'll get sick of it and say get stuffed. I mean that's the most natural reaction in the world. Now I know, I know diplomats and governments aren't supposed to behave that way, but I'm trying to appeal to the viewer who may be watching this, who gets sucked in by the media, to, their, their depiction of this, and say, no, think about relate on a human level. This is rubbish. We are literally being told these people are monsters, yet we're doing business with them, and they're saying, well, what do you want? Don't treat us that way, right, or else we're going to lose patience. And it sounds like the president of China has lost patience with the prime minister of Canada. Did you see what your your best mate Vicky said about this? She called it a threat. I did see. (laughs) I saw her say that, and I'm thinking, I I was scratching my head. I'm thinking, what do you mean a threat? (laughs) Yeah, well, that was a threat in her book, uh, which which obviously explains why she thinks she's being um, threatened sure. all the time, because she sees threats in in somebody who tells her that she's made a mistake or she's done something wrong. That's a threat, apparently. Yeah. Um, yeah well, for really me, it was interesting because I've been watching Xi Jinping since before he became the president. I mean, when when it was kind of he was the vice premier and and likely to move up he was one of the contenders for the job i started paying attention to him i've never seen him angry i've never seen him show emotion of any sort he's very benign he's very um, that's yeah. him all the time you never see him show any emotion except for benignness if that's an emotion uh, and it it just struck me as strange that he must have been very very angry to tell someone publicly like that because that's very unlike the chinese he now knows that canada as a country has lost face in china because they have this guy as their president prime minister Uh, so yeah so canada is actually the whole country has now lost face and i think the chinese people in canada and there are a lot of them would be aware of that be very well aware of that and I'm wondering what the next step is from that. And that's why I think it's an important discussion about the G20. Lots of other things went on, but there's really only those three things that I thought were important. The, the Biden meeting, the Trudeau bollocking, and the next one, which will be the Albanese thing. I, so, I think, by the way, Trudeau walked away from that conversation. He knew. He, he, was, he was clearly involved in the original conversation. He knew whatever had been leaked to the media and how was false. Yes. And how can you defend that? And so he had this, he had this um mealy mouthed platitude. And then yeah. um he didn't even listen to, listen to the, the full translation before he said it. I don't think he can, unless he can speak Chinese, um, he didn't even listen to the full translation before he said it, and then he walked away and he looked like the he, full he, translation he, is up now. Um Kiwe Wong has put a full translation up and, and he's also uh um uh, adjusted the sound so the, the volume is clearer. So you can hear it in Chinese. You can hear the translation. Anybody can say, "Well, that's true." It's what what uh, what he said is true. So it's it's up there on Twitter now, and it's a, it's quite a good uh, translation. Um, and I th- and I think for me, it was the first time I've ever seen that happen. I mm. see that Canada has lost face. Canada didn't get to have a one-on-one meeting with Biden, and I think they asked for it. Oh, sorry, with um, with Xi, and I think they asked for it. So that's a pretty serious step now. They have got a bigger problem than Australia had, I believe. Australia didn't get returned phone calls for a couple of years. The Morrison government really screwed up the relationship with China. And now Albanese, Penny Wong, are meeting their opposite numbers. And to me, 
it looked positive. What did you think? Well, remind me, uh, Jerry, when you lived in Australia and you you were in Queensland, weren't you? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you've also and, been... And um, I, I lived six years in Queensland, uh, two years, nine years in Queensland, two years in Sydney and two years... No, sorry, nine years, two years and six years. Two years in Adelaide and six years in New South Wales, in Sydney. Oh, okay. So, and, and uh, of course, you're a prison officer, but also you'd been a cop in London. I and was you... never a prison officer. Oh. <laughs> no, no. I worked in prisons. I, I, I was the general manager of a security of a division of oh, Chubb Security. The reason I'm answering the question that way is because um, with your background in Australia, you would be aware of the reputation of Queensland cops. And yeah. we, have a, we have a Queensland cop who is now our opposition leader and the former defence minister in, the, in Peter Dutton. And I, know. I think I think the most interesting thing about Albo, Albanese meeting Xi Jinping is Peter Dutton's response. Because yeah. before the meeting, Peter Dutton went and met the Chinese ambassador to Australia right. and tweeted about it in, in very I saw um, that. Yeah. diplomatic terms. And then... Um, yesterday, he was on the media uh, supporting Albanese in um, having this meeting, hopefully getting some trade gains out of it for Australia to undo the sanctions, etc. And I'm thinking, who are you and what have you done with Peter Dutton? Because <laughs> this is the same man who, in the election back in um, April, had almost declared war. Yeah. Right? He said, we are, de we are preparing for war with China. Yep. And it's, there's been so so there's a shift in the public positioning in Australia. Now, the shift was initiated by the Chinese government in response to the election. They were happy mm -hmm. to say, OK, yes, we've had this terrible relationship, but you've now got a new government. We are willing to draw a line under that and treat you as a new government um, in good faith. Right. Unfortunately, there was a certain amount of momentum from the old regime that continued on with uh, Mr Albanese and he kept saying, we haven't changed, China's changed, and he justified Australia continuing to take this sort of a harsh tone. But I know in actual, the in, in terms of the action, the concretes, not the words, you're right. The meetings spoke volumes, the fact that Penny Wong had the meeting with her counterpart, Wong Yi, and now, and then that has ultimately led to this. We wanted this meeting with Xi, by the way, mm. um, and it's happened. Now, the other thing I'll say before talking about the actual meeting, I was struck by the way it's almost as if we have a, a centrally controlled media in Australia, Jerry. You do. <laughs> well, I know we do, but try and tell that to the average Aussie because okay. if they're paying attention, if, if there was a switch flicked on the tone of the media. Suddenly, Clearly, everybody wanted this to go well, and the media marched in lockstep. It was all mm. reported that, that the sniping stopped a little bit on the sides, but no yeah, one. It didn't. It didn't stop. I did some research yesterday. I can assure you, it didn't stop. But well, there's, well there's there was some... more positivity, but the negativity was still very much there. Did you see Stan Grant's ABC article? Okay, I'll send. Where... I'll send you a link after the after the show. Okay, but that's a leopard. You, you can't ask a leopard to change his spots. Right? This is I'm, true. Not, I'm talking about the more um, the more mass consumption stuff that the, yeah. the majority of people consume, right? Where there was just this was the leading news item, as if it was great, a great breakthrough. And I'm thinking, well, blow me down. You've been talking about this country as if it's the worst country in the world that for quite a few years now, and your act, your actions now in discussing this in such positive terms, mm -hmm. um, either indicates that somehow China has changed remarkably in just a few days, or there yep. was something wrong with your reporting for the last few years, right? Interestingly, anyway, I, I, I would say when, when we say that the re, you say the reporting has changed, I agree with you, it has changed, uh, but the negativity is still there. There's more positivity involved in it. And what several of the reports said was China has changed and Albanese has told them they need to capitulate. Uh, the Australian Financial Review says China has to agree to this. This about faces because of China's own problems. Um, 
Stan Grant called him a genocide. It, it actually said, you know, he, he you know, meeting a man who has been described as as uh, committing genocide. So he didn't say he has committed genocide. He's been described as committing genocide. So it's very carefully worded. Um, the 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 Guardian had something almost the same kind of uh, all the, the same tones. And I, I've I've actually I've written an article for John Menadju, which incorporates some of that stuff. You'll see that tomorrow. Um, but so, so let it's me definitely just, there. No, no, for sure. But let me distinguish between what I would call like the mass impression media. Mm -hmm. and still the sophisticated media that sophisticated people consume, right? But they're a minority. So that kind of analysis media, of course, that, that hasn't changed. But there's a mass impression media out there that the right. masses of Australians consume out of the corner of their eye because they're not really interested in the news much, in politics much, in geopolitics at all, right? They've got their mm -hmm. own problem. But this stuff washes over them and and it's and what that's the that's the kind of switch from sudden from from blanket negativity to around this actually uh the the background noise was was mostly positive within that sure there's some absolute garbage and i think the one i thought took the cake is um not even stan grant it's peter harcher you used the word capitulation I saw that. yeah he said this is what a great power capitulation looks like we are the mouse that roared apparently <laughs> we we have brought China the dragon to its knees to to bend the knee. We were supposed to bend the knee to China. The the, the dragon bent the knee to the mouse instead. Right? Yeah, the, the bottom line. You're right, and it is all that. The bottom line is it really doesn't matter who capitulated to whom. The fact is, we're now on a turning point. And it can get better instead of staying rock bottom where it was. And I think if you want, it's again, like Trudeau, it's a face saving thing. Uh, if you want to, you can read into this whatever you want. Australia forced China to come back to the table. I don't know if people realize this, but China provides um, the highest percentage, like 30 or 40 percent, maybe 60 percent of all of Australia's goods. So massive. it's it's massive, yes. I think it was sixty-seven percent. I'd have to check that, but it's a very large percentage. China is Australia's number one importer, number one exporter, number one. If you lose that as a customer, you lose that as a supplier. You enter the third world. You become a third world country. It's as simple as that. Australia is very interesting in that two percent of China's exports, two percent, go to Australia. Two yeah. percent. So if they lose that, yeah, so what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The GDP drops off by zero point zero one one percent, something like that. As far as imports, it's much bigger. It's three times bigger. It's six percent. China brings in six percent of all of its imports from Australia. So let's get this one straight. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you think, what you want to think. China is willing to talk to Australia, always has been. It stopped picking up the phone when Australia were being dickheads about it. But right now, Australia are not being dickheads. And I think we're on the road. Do you know that next month, next month, the 22nd of December, is a very important day? Did you know that? 50 years of relations yep. between China and Australia. And I think our old friend John Lander was involved in that back in 19, early 1970s. He was, he was involved in writing up the paperwork for that. He was. And uh, as you yeah. know, I've interviewed, I've interviewed John. Um, Great interview. John Great interview. You, and and um, you should get him on this program too. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I might talk to yeah, him about that. I'm, yeah. sure glad, I'm sure he'd be glad to do it. He's uh, a lovely guy. In fact, get his insights into that, into that um, relationship. Based on what you've said, I'm picturing uh, a Venn diagram of that looks like a penny farthing, with the with the wheels slightly overlapping, so that for the little wheel, almost yeah. all of it overlaps the big wheel. But for the big wheels, there's a tiny bit in the corner that overlaps the little wheel, and yeah. that's the Australia, that's the Australia China tr trade you know, relationship, right? Trade yeah. relationship, and we, it really is where our bread is buttered, and. Yeah. Everybody knows that, and I do know that from Western Australia, which is 
this part of the map for the for the foreign viewers. This great big huge chunk here. It's, it's, it's in all, the west. It's all Western Australia. Um, I do know that that government, which not, which is comp has no um, misunderstanding whatsoever that its economy, which is an iron ore based economy, is dependent on China. They are the ones they helped Albanese get elected because you got a lot of people elected in that state, and they are the ones who are telling who have been telling him, "You better fix this, right?" Mm -hmm. So there's been there's been internal pressure. Now I do want to, I do have some observations about the meeting though because I, I have a I'm curious about some that there's something that doesn't compute here about the meeting. Okay. Um, it was a 32 minute meeting, and it was a positive meeting. We know it was a positive meeting, and Xi Jinping said positive very positive things and you can you can read that in the um in the report from both sides global times is good oh, okay good i haven't i haven't seen that yet but, i'll send you that uh, link two, two links i'll send you afterwards yeah global times yeah. did a good one okay good please do because because when anthony albanese gave his press conference to the australian media afterwards he went through this checklist of all these issues negative issues that he had raised that he said he'd raised with xi jinping xinjiang hong kong south china sea probably tibet who knows whatever he, he raised oh, oh, australians detained in china etc and he's going through this and i'm thinking you think you're expected to tell the press pack that this is what you talked about because that's what they're going to be demanding did you raise these issues but it was a 32 minute meeting you and i have been talking for 50 percent more than that in, in this show right yeah. how on earth and, and and give me a break they agree to the agenda before they meet the way elbow made it sound to the press as if xi jinping sat there while he lectured him for half an hour on supposed human rights issues and it, clearly that wasn't true so hey, when you've got two percent of their exports you can lecture <laughs> that's right that's right so that's that's an example of what how it's so distorted here that Albo thought he had to represent it in those terms completely imbalanced maybe maybe someone had scribbled down a list of things and gave it to an aide to Xi Jinping and said okay that's been covered let's talk about the real stuff right who knows how, what happened I'm, I'm not going to pretend but clearly the real meeting was something much more significant than what it was initially represented that way mm -hmm. and um I think again we have to see we have to see the results, but I do know that the um, uh, the Chinese from the Chinese side, they are committed to giving it a go, right? Because like because like I said, there's a new change of government, so they're committed to giving it a go. And I also know, and this is back to the Biden thing, the three-hour meeting with Biden and Xi gave Albanese important cover for his 30-minute meeting with Xi because the way the America, the Australian politics and press are, they're so sycophantic to the United States that if America can have the meeting, then that means we can have it as well. If, yeah. if America hadn't had the meeting, if Biden and Xi had been aggressive to each other, then um, it would have been interpreted very differently here the way we try. I actually, to get it. I actually made that comment in the article that will be out tomorrow on Pearls and Irritations. Yeah, uh, I think it's important. Today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, I agree with you 100%. Now, one thing that I'm really curious about, Biden, we said, or I said, has this problem when he gets back. He faces a hostile press. He faces hostile legislative or uh, legislation. Uh, he's He's got, and, I, and I, I did some research on China in the House of Representatives. Do you know there are over 5,000 bills or resolutions that are anti-China sitting in the Senate and Congress right now, over 5,000. And they're not gonna get pulled out. So there are, there are actually 5,033 anti-China bills or anti-China resolutions inside the Congress right now, or inside the House right now. And he's going back to face this hostility for being soft on China, if he is soft or seen to be soft on China. Albanese, I think, is going back to face an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that he's, you, you've mentioned that the press, once the press start to turn, then the public follows suit because the public say, well, oh, it's not as bad as we thought it was. What about the House? The, what about Parliament, the, the, the Senate and the House? What are they going to feel if Albanese is seen to be soft? 
and you already mentioned the Dutton mm. change. Uh, yeah, who has kidnapped Dutton and, and taken over his body uh, is a really interesting question. Uh, but do you think he's facing such hostility as Biden will when he goes back? No, I, I don't think so at all. And that's why th that's already been indicated uh, by Dutton. Um, that's that's why that was worth highlighting. Um, mm. Bear in mind, now I don't take any credit for Dutton's change of heart at all, but I will say this: I will say this. You can. When Dutton tweet when Dutton tweeted his about his meeting with the Chinese ambassador, um, I really saw it as a as a as a shift in at least the public stance that these people want to take from a one that was so defined by this McCarthyite hysteria against China that no one was prepared to be seen to yeah. be doing anything with the Chinese. But at its height, or maybe not quite its height, but post-election, I went and had a meeting with the Chinese ambassador. In fact, I had dinner I with him yeah. with, um, with a former foreign minister from New Zealand, Matt Robson, who was visiting mm -hmm. at the time. We went and had met, and we tweeted a picture of ourselves at dinner. And we and I tell you, we did it to defy the McCarthyism because that's the only way you defeat a witch hunt like McCarthyism. You got to defy yeah. it, right? You can't reason with it. You got to defy it. We are not intimidated by you in the media and what you're trying to do, um, and and the politicians. And within a few weeks, we've now got one of the more um, extreme um, opposition leaders or political leaders we've ever had in Peter Dutton following suit. Remember, I think we might have talked about this last time you, went, you and I talked, there was a big shift in the Australian Chinese community's vote in the yes. in the federal election. Yep. And I, that has that really caught everyone's attention, right? Because there's mm -hmm. one and a half million Australian Chinese. Yep. And yep. as a as a sense the size of the electorate, it's quite large. And en masse, they moved their vote from about being um 70% Liberal Party voters to almost that much Labor Party voters, and all because they had decided that people like Scott Morrison, our former Prime Minister, and Peter Dutton had no clue what they were talking about when it came to China, right? Mm. It was a big shift in vote, and that got their attention. So that has helped, but you didn't see the tone change straight away because, like I said, there was this momentum. Yeah. But, now, yeah. but now this uh, meeting indicates at least a position to want to change the tone. So I don't think Albanese is coming back to... The same kind of pressure that that um, Biden's going to go back to, and can okay. I say a final point about that though? Yeah, because 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 he's not, and because there's a chance to have a a more rational discussion in Australia about China. Hopefully, that gets reflected back into the United States because there's an element of this where, like, it's the dog wagging. Uh, the tail wagging the dog or what mm -hmm. comes first, the chicken or the egg, there's there's always been a strong current in Australia to beg the United States for protection. We need you for protection, right? And politicians... On what? Well, that is the $64,000 question, right? Yeah. They'll, they'll give you answers like China, but it never makes any sense. There's never any evidence for it. But it's this, mm -hmm. it's the yellow peril. It goes back 150 years, some of this sub more subliminally. Um, but it's there. Yeah, we need the United States for protection. If Australia didn't deliver that message to the United States and Australia is saying, hang on, we've got a good relation. This is this is working for us right now, right? We don't mm -hmm. feel we need protection. And better elements in the United States who want some sanity, right, say can reflect that back into America's debate, saying, well, the Australians aren't begging us for protection, because take the Huawei thing. I think we were. I think there was some form of a conspiracy. I'm going to allege that between a Five Eyes conspiracy to get Australia to take the lead on Huawei, because it made no sense that we would do what we did to Huawei, as if we're mm -hmm. we're somehow it's a security threat to us. But it gave the Americans cover. So oh, the Australians took the lead on banning Huawei and and, and got the Five Eyes to march along with it. What a what a lot of rubbish. But then yeah. that was going to be used in the United States. See, we're backing up the Aussies for standing up to to um the Chinese. If that tone mm. changes even a little bit, that may that may help Biden slightly, Jerry. I I, I hope you're right. I think I you so could be. You could be. But I also see uh, the, the hostility that I feel or the, or the pressure or the opposition that Biden will feel going back to, China, to, to America when he goes back to America. He's going to feel that opposition to any positive 
approach with China. He's going to get that opposition. And it comes from both the Senate and the Congress and the media, and it comes from the public who are following those, those leads. So it's a very, very big problem for him. I wonder if the Senate, the Congress, the media, and the, uh, the public would force Australia into a position where they come back and despite Australia's own wishes and the Australian people and the Australian parliament, they feel pressurized by this massive pressure from the United States. I, I, I have I some optimism, but I, I, I just, I don't feel 100% confident that they're gonna be allowed because, you know, as John Mearsheim and Henry Kissinger have both pointed out, you don't want to be America's friend. It's okay to be their enemy. But it's really bad to be America's friend if you don't go, if you don't toe their line. And that but kind I of pressure from the, the that kind of pressure from the United States is definitely how it, um, uh, it the change in Australia came about. So they might they may try and re-engineer that. But um, when I talked about the general media impression before, I mean one of those yeah. probably one of those includes the most feral media, anti-China media, in my view, in Australia, which is Sky News, which is Rupert Murdoch, and um, it's not perfect at all. I'm not. It hasn't. It's not Damascus Road conversion. But they too were more positive than negative in um, recent times. And in mm -hmm. fact, maybe we, maybe I can get you a, a link to this, and you can put it underneath. There was a. I tweeted about this today. The Sky News even published um, an article by a historian uh, named Sherry Sufi, which was I, I, I was flabbergasted. It was on Sky News where he. Um, I don't I don't agree with everything he says, but he he wrote this article clearly delineating what Australia's actual national interest is in relation to China and what mm -hmm. is in the, is the interest of other influences and powers like especially the United States and where how what we're what's what we have the potential to do with this Albanese Xi meeting is go back to to doing things that are in our national interest. And then he gives the context for all these all the bad blood between us over the last few years, why most of it was actually our doing, not China's yeah. doing. And yeah. it's quite it's quite extraordinary that Sky News published well, it's it. It's interesting that that's coming out in mainstream media now because I mean, from my perspective, sitting in China, reading the Global Times, the China Daily, the People's Daily, which I do, um, these these articles all said the same thing. You know, what have we done to upset Australia? That the Chinese people didn't know what happened to Australia. They were our friends. You know, yeah, 2015, we signed a free trade agreement. That still exists. Yeah. And, and here's the interesting thing. Trade with China and Australia has never gone down. It's no. always consistently gone up. Yeah. And that is something like, it's really hard to believe that most Australian people think that China is somehow sanctioning Australia. They're not. There's four products under dispute, but there's 85 other products that Australia disputed first. And then the China's buying up Australia. No, they own 3.1. If you count Hong Kong and China, mainland China together, they own 3.1% of all foreign owned assets in Australia. But China is not your enemy. China is not your threat. That's the way I view that. Maybe. Anyway, are you? Let's let's wrap it up fairly soon. But are you optimistic or pessimistic? And what's the percentage about the future of the relationship with China Australia? What's the pH scale of optimism and pessimism? How does that? How do we, how do we measure that? <laughs> so it's, it's a very good question. The, <laughs> well, are you are you more optimistic than pessimistic? No, I no, I'm I, I'm. Um, I feel optimistic when I see uh, evidence of a shift in the right direction. I know it can be, you know, what do they call it? A, um, uh, uh, you know, a false spring or something like that. You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. False winter, flag can, or, yeah. winter yeah. can come back, right? The um, that sort of thing. In fact, we have that. We're having. We're going through that now, right? It's it's yeah. winter in Melbourne right now. I kid you not. We had really? a false spring. Oh yeah, it came back with a vengeance. The lowest, yeah. the lowest temperature ever recorded in in Victoria happened this week, ever. Okay, happened this week. Um, wow. Anyway, yeah, crazy. Anyway, so the, the false spring, right? Winter can come back with a vengeance. I hope that doesn't happen. But when the signs of a spring, though, of a thaw, then um, you got to say, okay, well, that's better than 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 nothing. And talking is better than not talking, as I've said. So I do feel a little bit more optimistic. Um, 
uh, but there's a lot of work to be done. We we have been committed to playing a role in shifting our country's foreign policy. We're nowhere near to doing that because the other the thing we haven't talked about is the stuff that's still going on, such as the, the stationing of B-52 bombers, which may be nuclear capable in Darwin. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, for a, that's for a different meeting. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. But if, if that already happened, happened, that already happened, and if Xi Jinping was willing to have the meeting anyway, yeah. right, and, and he can be magnanimous to, to the degree he needs to, then, then that's still a, a good sign. And, and um, so that's my view. I'm, 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 I'm more optimistic than I was a little while ago. Am I more optimistic than pessimistic? Oh, that's, I'm not sure yet. We have to I have to analyze the the pH scale more closely. Yeah, well, I feel the same. I, I'm I'm better than 50-50 on it. That's okay, the way yeah. I feel. Uh, and I think I'll take your suggestion up. I'll, I'll send a message to John as soon as I'm finished here and say, hey, how about we get together? But I might try and time that for December the 22nd. I think that he should. Be he was right. He was right in the middle of it. Celebrate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think right I think it needs to be celebrated, and and I think probably he would he would appreciate that too. So, yeah. okay, anything else you want to wrap up before we wrap up? Anything else you want to add to this? Uh, no, um, I appreciate the opportunity. I, uh, you know, you and I uh, have talked uh, a fair bit, fair bit now since when did I interview yeah. you? Twenty twenty, I think. Um, yeah. So, long so long. it's good to get to to know each other through this forum, and I'm hoping that um, one day soon, if COVID restrictions etc. out of the way, we might even be able to visit. That would be great because I get accused of being. Uh, I'm fascinated that people in China know me because um, I've never even been there except a layover at the yeah, airport. Oh, we layover, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I yeah, you're, know, you're known in Zhongshan anyway, that's for sure, uh, okay. because it was a Zhongshan friend of mine who asked, can you can you talk to him and ask him what he thinks? Sure, I can. Yeah, yeah, he'll do that. And and that's why it was quite late last night. I, I said, well, I'll talk to you now. While I remember it, I'll just send you a message. But yeah, you, you're, you're known. You're known. Um, maybe you're vicariously famous from me. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. <laughs> it, it's it's funny. It, it's it's really funny because I'm not at all famous in Zhongshan. Nobody knows who I am in Zhongshan. And I was in Chongqing a few weeks ago and bumped into someone in a hotel breakfast bar. And they, Are you Jerry Gray? Yeah. It's like, oh, this is weird. It's very weird. I go out of chi out of town and people know me, but in Zhongshan, yeah. I'm just me. Yeah. No, your favorites on Twitter though. Good good on you for getting on it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, that's been uh, it's uh, coming up to three years now since I started Twittering. But yeah. All right, Robbie, let's let's call it a day there. We finished within the hour. Wow. We did well. Yeah. And thank, thank you thank once you again for your time. Really appreciate it. And it's great to talk to you. And if you ever do get to China, the beers are on me. All right. All right. Thanks, See ya.